This next song is one that comes from the very depth of the struggle of my people in America. One that might have been sung by my own father. A few nights ago, I sang in Brooklyn to the general conference of the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church, in which my father labored for many years as a minister. And today, my brother is pastor of the Mother Church, in New York City. This church has a great history. Frederick Douglass printed his paper, The North Star, in the cellar of the Zion Church in Rochester, New York. Harriet Tubman, one of the great abolitionists and founder of the Underground Railroad, by which many of my people came to freedom in Canada in those days. Yes, Harriet Tubman and Sojourner Truth and my father might have sung this next song, must have sung it. No more auction block for me. No more pint of salt for me. No more driver's lash for me. Though many thousands are gone, freedom we will have. Right, Travis, you can go ahead. All right. Uh, we begin by acknowledging that we are gathered on the traditional ancestral unceded land of the Bakoji or Iowa, Sauk, and Meskwaki peoples. We offer our respect to their elders, both past and present, as well as future generations. We recognize that our presence here today is the result of ongoing exclusions and an erasure of indigenous peoples who were the original stewards of this land. As these words of acknowledgement are spoken and heard, let the ties these nations have to their traditional homelands be renewed and reaffirmed. I want to give a special thanks to the Claudia Jones School for Political Education for hosting us tonight. Uh, founded in 2020, the Cla Claudia Jones School for Political Education is a popular education organization committed to building class consciousness, the struggle against racism and white supremacy and other forms of oppression in Washington, DC and the broader metropolitan community. It strives to be a force in the fight against the injustices of a racist ruling class engaged in relentless class war against the working poor, whose labor is the source of capital that is used against the workers in the furthering their exploitation. Uh, our first guest tonight will be Noah Lawrence. 
Uh, Noah is a high school study social teacher at Hinsdale Central High School in suburban Chicago, where he has been teaching since 2005. He currently teaches courses on world cultures, East Asia studies, and African American history. The African American history course is one that Noah created himself and brought to the school board for adoption in 2010. The course was approved and he has taught it every semester since. Noah grew up in the nearby suburb of Elmhurst before attending Grinnell College where he earned a history degree along with certification for secondary education. After a brief stint teaching at Lamoni High School in the small town of Lamoni in Southern Iowa, he enrolled in graduate school at the University of Iowa to pursue a master's degree in social studies education. It was then that he first learned of Edna Griffin and her, her history of activism. Noah decided to write his master's thesis on her efforts to desegregate Katz Drugstore, once located on the intersection of 7th and Locust Streets in Des Moines. He later revised and updated his thesis for publication, and it was printed in the fall 2008 edition of Annals of Iowa under the title, Since It Is My Right, I Would Like to Have It, Edna Griffin and the Katz Drugstore Desegregation Movement. In addition to teaching, Noah also coaches boys cross country in track and field. He lives in the district he teaches with his wife, Megan, and their daughters, Cleo and Alexis. Noah? Uh, thank you all for inviting me here today. Um, it's uh, an honor to be able to share my research on uh, Edna Griffin, who is somebody I didn't know about growing up, um, but have come to have an incredible appreciation for. And what I hope to do today is to tie her story into the broader story of the civil rights movement. So for um, some of you who are not from Iowa, or, or for many of you, you might not be familiar with her story. The incident that I wrote my master's thesis on involved a protest against a local drug chain called Cat's Drug Store. Uh, there was a day in uh, July of 1948 where Edna Griffin and two friends, um, Leonard Bibbs and, uh, or sorry, John Bibbs and Leonard Hudson, uh, decided that they were going to go to Cat's Drug Store to get something cold to drink. It was over 100 degrees that day. They sat down at the lunch counter and asked for an ice cream sundae. Uh, the waitress took their order, um, but was approached by a young manager who whispered something in her ear, and she came back and reported, we are not equipped to serve colored here. Uh, and so Griffin appealed to the manager, uh, and uh, in her accounting, they had a polite conversation, but he reiterated that they did not serve colored people at the store. Uh, and then she appealed to the owner, Maurice Katz, who told her the same thing. So they had a multi-pronged attack to um, address this. And the legal case, the transcript is very interesting because uh, there actually had been um, a long history of um, cases filed against the Katz Drug Store. In the 18 years previous, there had been 14 civil cases and three criminal cases brought, uh, and none of them had succeeded. And Edna, you know, would go on to say that, um, unlike Rosa Parks, she had an advantage in that Iowa did have a civil rights law on the books. Um, but it was not a law that had been particularly well enforced. And the excuse, uh, or the legal argument that the Katz team gave at the trial uh, involved alleging that the reason that they had um, not served Edna Griffin that day was that she has she was causing a disturbance. Uh, and so on the witness stand, she had to play into some of the cultural expectations of her time, uh, that she was uh, middle class, that she was the wife of a doctor, um, emphasizing her motherhood. She had come in actually with her one-year-old daughter, Phyllis, at the time. Um, and to play down her activism. Uh, but in the meantime, while, while she is uh, playing up her um, upwardly mobile credentials in the court of law, uh, she was also involved in direct action protests against the drugstore. Uh, and so she had formed a committee to fight Jim Crow uh, and they had organized a series of sit-ins uh, picketing and boycotts. And I think one thing that is interesting is that they tried to tie in their local movement 
to the broader fight against Nazism. This was 1948. World War II was fresh in everybody's memory. Um, African Americans had waged the Devil V campaign, victory at home, and then the fight for civil rights abroad. Uh, and so we can see that being reflected in um, the multiracial groups that attempted to pressure cats um, through these boycotts to change their policies as well. Uh, and this ended up being a year and a half long fight that involved a criminal case, a civil case, and direct action. Uh, but it did ultimately result in December of 1949 in uh, a legal victory. Um, in the civil case, Katz was awarded, or uh, Katz was punished a total of $1, um, but it was still nonetheless a victory. Uh, but more significantly, Katz agreed to cease their discriminatory practices, and African Americans from that point forward were able to be served when they went to the lunch counter at Katz Drugstore. Uh, the state of Iowa, um, 50 years later in 1998, would uh, come to embrace Edna Griffin. Uh, and she is now honored with uh, the Edna Griffin building, um, with a bridge, with a park. Um, but she was certainly not uh, somebody that the government was embracing at the time that she was waging this battle against Katz Drugstore. And as a matter of fact, uh, she has a, an interesting and long history of activism. As you can see here, the FBI began surveillance on her right around the time that she began this um, fight against the Katz Drugstore. Um, from what I could tell from my research, she moved a lot uh, around a lot when she was younger, um, having lived in Kentucky, New Hampshire, Massachusetts. Uh, when it was time to go to college, she had offers from Oberlin, uh, Eastern School of Music, but ultimately decided to attend Fisk University, a uh, very prestigious historically Black college. Uh, it was at Fisk that she would meet her husband, Stanley. Um, they uh, also picketed together against Mussolini's invasion of Ethiopia. Um, that was the, you know, the first of many different political actions that she would take in her life. Uh, other actions, she would um, be a founding member of the Des Moines branch of CORE and would arrange for a bus to attend the March on Washington. She was involved in the um, Progressive Party in Iowa. As we can see here, she was involved with the Shirley Chisholm campaign. Um, as in into the 70s and 80s, she was uh, waging her activism against nuclear warfare, um, joining a group that uh, stopped a train by standing in the middle of a, a train track to prevent nuclear warheads from being brought along. So a few lessons that I'd like to share with you guys uh, that, that I thought about, you know, upon being invited to uh, speak today um, and thinking back into my research, which I first did uh, about 15 years ago. I think the most important thing that I would like to emphasize, and I this comes from my perspective as a high school teacher, um, is that there's a, a dominant narrative about the civil rights movement that places its beginning um, around the mid-1950s, sometimes with Brown versus Board of Education, Emmett Till, um, or Rosa Parks. Certainly that's when the Eyes on the Prize documentary starts the story, um, which and it's a great documentary. Uh, but as a matter of fact, uh, it is the case that African Americans have always been struggling for civil rights. Um, and you could date the start of this story to uh, World War II. You could date it to the Civil War. Uh, but the best answer I ever heard came from a professor of mine who said that the civil rights movement started the moment the first African was brought to American shores. Uh, and as we know, that movement still goes on today. Secondly, um, I think that Edna Griffin's story is important because it um, allows us to look at history from the ground up. Um, a, uh, another figure that I admire is Ella Baker, who believed that the way to bring about change uh, is empowering local people. Um, and so while well, the history books are filled with the stories of Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, perhaps Rosa Parks. Uh, it is undoubtedly true that without people like Edna Griffin um, and the others who joined her in her fight to bring change against cats and all of these local movements, which later coalesced into more national movements, the civil rights movement likely would not uh, have been as powerful. On that note, um, her story illustrates that change takes 
a long time. Uh, and to solve a problem, you have to attack it from a variety of different angles. So as I mentioned in her case, um, there was the civil case, uh, the criminal case, and the direct act action cases, all of these happening at the same time, letters being written into newspapers. Um, many had tried to get cats to change before and had been unsuccessful, uh, but Edna Griffin showed patients persistence and networking uh, and was able to get cats to change. And, and that was a domino because she understood that if cats would change, other uh, establishments in Iowa would as well. Finally, um, her story emphasizes the importance of um, playing up certain aspects of your identity in certain contexts uh, and others in different contexts. So when she was at the trial, um, in order to persuade the jury uh, and judge to support in her favor, she played up her uh, service in the military. She played up her motherhood. She played up her uh, middle class status as the wife of a doctor. And at the same time, um, she had you know true activist credentials uh, as members uh, as a, mem a member of the Communist and Progressive Party of Iowa. So finally, um, I would conclude by just saying that um, I found as a as a history teacher that. Um, we need to go beyond the textbooks that we have and we need to look in our own communities and find the stories of the people um, within those communities who brought effective change, study how they do that uh, and draw inspiration from them. So I thank you all um, for giving me your attention today and I look forward to what our other panelists have to say as well. Thank you. Thank you, Noah. I appreciate that wonderful presentation. Um, next up, we have Joe Henry. Joe Henry began work early in life to help his single parent mother take make ends meet and spent his early adult life working in warehouses, factories, and driving a truck for the United Parcel Service while obtaining an undergraduate degree from Iowa State University. After college, Joe began a 40 year journey into social justice working with members of the black and brown communities and organizations such as the Catholic Worker, ACORN, Iowa Citizen Energy Coalition, Teamsters Union, and the Rainbow Coalition. His mentors include such people as Iowa civil rights leader Edna Griffin, who helped him understand the need to build coalitions in order to win long-term social justice battles. His many accomplishments include leading a national team, uh, a national strike of Teamsters and warehouse workers leading to a historic $800 million contract mobilizing against anti-Latino laws in Iowa, mobilizing Latinos to turn out to vote in record numbers, working to bring attention to the meatpackers working conditions during COVID, and has won numerous awards, including the Luis Noun Award by the American Civil Liberties Union of Iowa and the 2017 LULAC Cesar Chavez Leadership Award for work on Latino voter engagement. Joe? Wow, oh, thank you. <laughs> I need to be my... Uh, promoter. Uh, thank you, Travis. It, it's a great privilege to be here to speak about Edna Griffin. I met Edna when I was only 26 years old, one year out of college. Uh, I started to go to her private meetings over at 1608 44th Street. When I first met Edna, she wanted me to, she wanted to find out from me what my politics were. And I proceeded to tell her that I had just gotten involved in social justice work, uh, that I was you know, not only uh, involved in Democratic Party politics, but also Socialist Party politics, and just involved with a lot of different things. So first thing she said then was, you know, Joe, you need to get serious. You need to join the party. So in so in the summer of 1982, I decided to join the Communist Party and go to Edna Griffin's private monthly meetings with her and Stan and other comrades. At those meetings, I learned a lot about, working, about the working class. I learned about Edna's work with unions, her work to free people from prison, her work with farmers, Iowa Farmers Union, Fred Stover, Merle Hansen, who were leaders, in the 50s and 60s, uh, Edna's work on ending the war in Korea. You know, her fight to end segregation in public places, Katz Drugstore, 
where she brought up where she was denied service, that whole struggle there. Uh, all of that she explained to me. She explained the importance of civil disobedience, of boycotts, protests, getting out in the streets. When she, Edna told me that when she moved to 1608 44th Street, which was a very white neighborhood, and she had not moved there until about 12 years after coming to Des Moines, she had to deal with hate calls, a church congregation down the street that was planning to burn a cross in her front yard just because she was black. It was a ter these terrible things that happened to Edna because she was fighting for the rights of, wor of the working class, fighting for people of color. She had many people who would come to her house who she would speak with and work with. Paul Robeson would come to her house to visit. Henry A. Wallace, when he ran for president, Edna was part of the Progressive Party, along with many comrades, to work to try to get Henry A. Wallace, an Iowan who was the second vice president of Roosevelt, Ro of uh, Theodore Roosevelt, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, um, many, many people. She realized the importance of building coalitions to fight for civil rights. And she always understood that it always starts with a few people, a nucleus just like it happened with the Katz drugstore, with only three people. Those things are very important. They resonated with me as I continued to learn more from Edna. And due to her mentoring, uh, I got more involved in the union movement. I ended up working in Washington, DC for the Teamsters Union and worked with many trade unionists on how to mobilize workers across the country. But it was due to Edna's mentoring the way she explained things, that is so important uh, for people to, to transfer that knowledge, that information, that strategy. And it all started with Edna. Some people would say that she was the Black Joan of Arc uh, because of all her inspiration, how she led people. I think also due to her party politics on how she was a party member, how she taught us on how to mobilize strategies all those things were very significant. So in the end, I am who I am because of Edna Griffin, her actions and strategies, her, her fight for social justice, her work with unions, her work to free prisoners, her work for social justice with farmers, all of her actions and strategies are things that can be applied in the current period. And as we have seen many times, especially with the BLM movement, those strategies are being replayed to fight for social justice, to fight to end racism. So uh, thank you, Travis, for having me on. Thank you, Joe. I appreciate that presentation. Our next guest is uh, Jerry at Vice Rouse. Uh, Jerry is a retired United Methodist minister who mostly retired when he did, when he did because of the church not only failed to live up to its professed ideals for justice, but actively stood in the way. He has become an activist as a young adult because his mother taught him to question everything, especially those things which, which were not to be questioned. He's always tried to do faith-based organizing. A small town Iowa boy, he has lived in Iowa all but three years of his life, which were spent in graduate school in Boston. He currently lives in Fairfield, Iowa, where he is even more politically active. Jerry? Thank you, Travis. It's uh, great to have this opportunity to be with everyone today. I'm glad so many of you could come and attend with us. I did not know Edna personally when some of our comrades, Joe first, and then some later were getting to know her in the 1980s. I was living in other parts of Iowa that were not in close proximity. I had heard about the Katz boycott and Edna's name associated with it when I was a student at Simpson College, just 15 miles south of Des Moines, but didn't get to know much about her or didn't follow up on the details. I wish I had known Edna. Many of the things I've read and been told about her bears are resonate very strongly with my own journey in life and the faith-based organizing I have tried to do over the years. And it was a part of her strategy also to work with churches 
as she fought for justice. In his Zoom interview celebrating the naming of the Edna Griffin building in downtown Des Moines last summer, hosted by the Iowa Architectural Foundation, Edna Son Stanley stated that as he and his sister were growing up, Edna considered everyone a part of her family. The Griffin's neighbors, when they lived on Third Street, the Irvines also affirmed Stanley's statement. And in what we have about Edna's life, she's quoted adding to that purpose her sense of family by saying, we all are God's children. It's those kind of values that make Edna the pioneer we're honoring today by retelling her story. As she predated the modern civil rights movement of the late 1950s and 60s, she also predated the movement that has become known as liberation theology, which I was asked to talk about today. Hard to do in five or six minutes. Begun by Latin American priests in the 1960s entitled the Third World Priest Movement, liberation theology recognizes the preferential option for the poor contained in the Hebrew and Christian scriptures we call the Bible. Marxist analysis was used to recognize the oppression and class structure in Latin American countries that resulted in miserable poverty for the vast majority of people. From pulpits, in their daily lives and work, and in faith-based organizing, using Bible study, third world priests began to fight the poverty they saw through the Marxist analysis, addressing greed and asking how much is enough. Some of the names that might be recognized from that movement are Gustavo Gutierrez, Leonardo Boff, Dom Helder Camara, Camilo Torres, and Bishop Oscar Romero, who was martyred in 1980 as he celebrated mass because he confronted the oppressive government of El Salvador, asking it to stop the oppression and the murder by the death squads and address the misery of the people as a whole. From my own story, I really connected with Edna talking about family and that we are all God's children. I have always used that image of God as a parent, the father and mother, creator, if you will, of all human beings. If this starting point is true, then are we not all brothers and sisters with every human being? And that is the first question I would ask of folks who would begin to judge and condemn folks who were struggling for justice. And if we are all brothers and sisters, then we should want for every human being everywhere in the world, brothers and sisters, what we want for our biological and legal family. That is enough food, shelter, help, and purpose, sense of purpose to meet our physical, emotional, and mental health needs, and to thrive as human beings. I believe Edna, maybe not in these words, but she asked these same questions and practiced these same values. A primary method of struggling for these goals has been within liberation theology and continues to be based community Bible study. Another third world priest, Ernesto Cardinal, has written about the studies in his community where he's a priest in Nicaragua. Those books are titled The Gospel in Solentiname. As I have tried to practice it over the years, each session, a scripture passage is read. And then in my preaching the following Sunday, I would preach upon that scripture passage. It's read by someone in the group, and typically, as the leader, I ask, what do you think? The materials that are used are not prescribed and prepared ahead of time, written by someone else to control the narrative. 
but the materials are what each person brings to the discussion from their own life, thoughts, and feeling. One of the most successful sessions was when I, again as a leader, did not need to say anything for 45 minutes. The opportunity to speak what is honestly on one's mind without being judged or told it is wrong helps people to feel like they are being taken seriously and that they are being heard. My bedrock conviction after 36 years in small town rural ministry in Iowa is that many folks have a sense of low self-esteem, do not think very much of themselves. To be taken seriously and heard helps build their self-esteem and confidence as people begin to think about how to practice and organize to address injustice. My task as a leader has always been to make sure that everyone who wants to say something gets the opportunity to speak, not to lecture, not to impose my point of view, although I'm not shy stating it when I think it's appropriate to have it be discussed as everybody else's point of view is. I always did my best to never present my view as better or more educated or the one that had to be listened to at any time. These reasons are why Edna is someone we honor. The values she of disposed as family, as everyone being her brother and sister, all God's children, are the same ones we progressive, Marxists, Democrats, a whole bunch of folk all together that we fight for today. And I'm honored to be a part of this panel and share with you today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jerry. I, I really appreciate you coming on the panel as well and, and talking to us about that. Um, our next guest is Matei Farrakhan Mohammed. Matei Mohammed was born in December of 1995 in Des Moines under the given name Matthew Bruce. Matei is a Des Moines based activist and artist who co founded the Des Moines Black Liberation Movement and operates under the creative engine, the Black Artivist which seeks to explore, educate, and radicalize us as human beings against the oppressive forces which seek to destroy our futures and steal our joy. Matei has asked me to ask him, uh, interview him with, with several questions that I've prepared. Matei, are you ready? Yeah, uh, before we start, uh, I'd like to uh, thank Jerry and thank y'all for uh, having me on. Thank you, Jerry, for those words. I actually like a uh, big fan of um, liberation theology. And uh, I just wanted to say I'm here at Inna Griffin Park on uh, 12th in college. So I'm gonna see if I can flip the camera for y'all. It's a lot of God's children out here. I don't know if I can zoom, but y'all see them playing on the playground. So uh, yeah, that's what's up. And we had a free breakfast out here earlier. Uh, I think they served over a hundred people as they do every two weeks. So. Uh, oh, wow. I've been well. Yeah, I yeah. saw the flyer for that too. It's it's uh, it's not, it's some good food too. I think eggs and sausage and-, and mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, today we have like a, a bunch of free groceries too, like bananas applesauce, uh, mixed berry sauce, peppers, pablanos, uh, all kinds of stuff. And then I uh, got a lot of those off and then sent some shipments around the city too. So, you know, it's weekly, it's weekly, it's daily out here. Um, the legacy lives on. Awesome. Um, what do you see as the challenges as well as the joys of black leadership in the struggle for black liberation? Um, okay, so I think we were talking before, uh, Right before this call, we were talking about um, uh, the FBI uh, trailing Edna, right? Mm -hmm. And um, like, why? Right, because like, there's a period where they stopped, like what was it, 1955, where they stopped and she no longer became a person of interest. So that tells you that they're making calculations, right? And so I think that's the first challenge for me at least was like that psychological ba battle of of like the double consciousness of knowing yourself, but also knowing the calculations that are constantly being made about you and your humanity. Um, you know, that's like a that's like a, a meta breaking of the humanity. You know what I mean? And so um, I think all of us have to deal with that. Uh, that's the challenge. Uh, but the joy is this. <laughs> the joy is 
the joy is life. The joy is um uh, what our brother just spoke about before. Um, community, um, the sunshine, the snow melting, uh, uh, direct actions on the horizon, those type of things. Yeah. Was there a moment uh, last year where, where that kind of double consciousness, um, you became aware of it? Uh, yeah, I mean, the first day, because uh, they're, they're flying drones over your head and, and driving uh, surveillance cars by that are unmarked and, and things like this and showing up in riot gear. So you know that, and you're not in riot gear. You didn't come for smoke like that. So you know that there's some kind of uh, miscalculation happening. There's oh, wow. some kind of miscommunication. Um, it's very simple. You know, I, I don't see no right here. Why are you in right here? Um, uh, that's the question to this yeah. day. Um, before we had talked about, uh, you know, kind of capitalism and, and uh, its intersection with, with Black liberation, uh, how do you see capitalism as, as intertwined with the fight for Black liberation? Um, mm. Yeah, and I asked you to ask me this question, right? <laughs> Uh um, it's everything. Um, I think often about like, I live on, uh, I live, I live uh, in Riverbend, which is uh, very adjacent to, uh, I think a lot of the FBI files uh, and they lived on third street. Mm -hmm. So that's, a, that's not very, that's less than half a dozen blocks away from where I live. And, um, I just think about just the, that, the noise and the sound and the movement daily and, um, you know, what that means uh, as far as uh, people's uh, inability to stop the motion, right? And so I think we think about every day, how do we stop that motion for people? How do we give them time for heal, or time for healing? Um, one of my good friends, uh, Linda Brown, said to me early on uh, last year when I moved back that rest is reparations. And so it's like, how do we um, uh, uh, put an end to hundreds of years of labor subjugation um, that began uh, with us um, and <laughs> alongside <clears throat> uh, indentured servants and alongside uh, people who were uh, slaughtered to make room for the land uh, to, to, to force people to labor for capital. Uh, so, uh, you know, Black people have always been aware of this. Uh, I would say that the Haitian Revolution was the first anti-capitalist movement um, and Black people have been leading that movement uh, ever since. Okay. Um, what, what role does multiracial coalition building have in the struggle for Black liberation? Um, you guys actually named a lot of it already, um, because it's a, it's a, it's a multicultural panel, right? Um, but I will say, uh, the one thing I could add is probably, um, the difference between diversity, uh, the difference between multiculturalism and multicultural, uh, or multiracial, uh, uh, coalition building. And the difference is this, um, like multiculturalism or diversity means that we're all gonna assimilate into this uh, capital building program together, this labor program together, right? And we're gonna find ways to make it uh, nicer or easier or more like what we once had. Um, but uh, coalition building means we're gonna all get together and we're gonna break uh, this thing. Um, and we're going to all be autonomous and we're gonna find out uh, in uh, what ways do our autonomy intersect um, and where those things intersect, how can we build? And um, I think it's that simple. Awesome. Um, I, you know, and I may ask this from the panel at large too, but, you know, in that multi-coalition building, um, do you, you talk about, you know, building along where each of us needs to, you know, has our self-interest? Um, mm -hmm. How do you see that with um, a lot of white people? Do you see a lot of apathy mm -hmm. um, from white people that you're, you try to organize or how do you, how do you deal with that? No, I, I don't think I see a lot of apathy. I think, um, honestly, I think I, we just see right now uh, the, uh, the need for the um, black leadership, young black leadership to be continued to be cultivated because we know that black people are the, um, the vanguard of that movement. So um, uh, like I was kind of saying to my friend earlier too, that, um, you know, when I landed here in Iowa, I found like a, a big multiracial coalition that was kind of like leaderless. And um, I came to understand that that leaderlessness was like on us, you know what I mean? Um, but I think uh, for uh, white people to begin to understand um, why I say that black people are the, uh, the, 
the vanguard. Understand why I say that the Haitian Revolution is the first anti-capitalist movement. Um, understand why uh, <clears throat> Black anti-capitalists throughout history have uh, struggled to identify with Marxism and their critiques of Marxism and their critiques of some of these things. Um, and to understand uh, uh, in the same way and fall in love with uh, indigenous uh, anti-capitalist movements to understand that there is a red deal out, for example, instead of a green new deal, a uh, red new deal um, that doesn't necessarily center um, green capitalism or some um, uh, green you know, techno revolution but um, a true authentic revolution uh, that centers the needs of indigenous people and black people, you know what I mean? So uh, being open to those conversations and being open to your mind being blown every day and the world being torn down, I think that's, uh, I think that's, the, uh, I think that's the key. Um, and also one more thing, Stokely Carmichael and Black Power in the beginning, he said that uh, shame could be a revolutionary emotion. So uh, not hiding from shame, uh, dealing with it, fighting it, conquering it. Uh, um, and then understanding that it reconquers you. Awesome. And I think that men understand that and uh, people with other kinds of privilege too. Yeah, we definitely need to understand kind of like where we fit in, you know, in terms of making change, certainly. So um, that's all the questions I think we've, that we've talked about. Did you have anything else that you thought of that you wanted to talk about your experiences as a Black leader here in Des Moines? Mm -hmm. mm. No, I just wanted to uh, thank you again for making space. Uh, um, thank you for some of the people that are, are putting on the production too. You know, shout out to y'all. Uh, shout out to everyone. Uh, I see some of the nice comments people are leaving. Um, <laughs> I love them personally. So thank you guys. Uh, Chance the Rapper said on stage, he won a Grammy. He said, gas me up. You know, that's my energy. So I appreciate y'all. Thank you, Matei. I, I appreciate your time today. <laughs> Um, all right. So next, what we'll be doing is is we're gonna have a we have a few pre prepared points of discussion um, that I wanted to present to the panel at large. Um, the first first issue I wanted to bring to the table just to see if anybody wants to take this up. Uh, in today's Black liberation struggle, police brutality is front and center. What do you see as the connection between police brutality and capitalism? Mm. So I was in Chicago uh, before I came to the morning briefly, just for like two days, uh, two or three days of the uh, beginning of the, the response to George Floyd's, um, uh, what's the extrajudicial, extrajudicial execution, um, may he rest in peace uh, and also good justice. But um, in those first few days uh, the, on the streets, uh, the leaders of uh, a lot of the uh, black led protests were talking about uh, the pig, the pigs protect the property. Right. And so um, I think that's a very simple and easy way to understand it, that the pigs protect the property. Uh, when were they out there? What were they protecting? You could literally see it. They were protecting glass windows. They were protecting cars. They were protecting their own cars. Uh, they were not protecting people. Um, and at the end of the day, uh, we'll see. You will see when uh, um, these economies fail as rent fails because it's a failed uh, idea when insurance fails, when all these other systems, the stock market fails and all these other systems fail, uh, what will hold up the austerity programs uh, between the hungry people that need the money and the capitalists that are, are, are desperately holding on to it will be the pigs. Um, and it'll be very clear uh, that the, the, um, the police are the, uh, are the last line of defense. And in fact, uh, the military is the only other line of defense. Um, that's what this system is. It's a war machine that creates capital. So uh, the, the, the pigs are just the uh, domestic arm and wing. Awesome. Um, did anybody else want to add anything? All right. Um, I, I, I asked this to Matei, but I, I want to ask this to the panel at large. Um, Edna Griffin faced white apathy in a heavily white state. Um, how do we overcome those same issues in heavily white states in the Midwest today? What appeals can we make to unify people in common interests similar to the way Edna connected uh, cats to Hitler and, and fashion? Um, Joe? Yeah, yeah. Well, well clearly uh, the, the same strategies are required uh, today as they were before. And to 
the constant work of building black white unity it was something that the party was really first and foremost on the front end with uh, back in the 30s and 40s. And, and, and it clearly showed that. But building bridges uh, is important. And, you know, the thing that we have learned in the party, and of course I've been in the party now for almost 40 years, is you have to build those coalitions. You have to find, find out what the economic interests are, bring those uh, issues together for a common bond. We don't do enough of that here in Iowa. I mean, the same thing applies here. We need to be talking about a progressive economic interest between, between rural Iowa and urban Iowa. Uh, that's not hard to do, but it takes, you know, for lack of a better way of saying it, kind of a, a group of people, it can be a small group, to be switchboard operators, to communicate those similarities, how to build those relationships. So that's very important. It can be done here. And, and not enough has been done. Edna was true, a true inspiration when she did it in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. And uh, we have forgotten uh, some of those strategies. Clearly, from what I learned from her, I took with me when I worked for the Teamsters to, to build those coalitions, not only in the US, but across the world. So those are important. Awesome, very, thank you for that, Joe. Um, Edna moderated her public images, as Noah noted in his presentation, um, that was in a way that she felt was needed to win the fight. Um, does that kind of respectability politics still have a place in the fight for civil rights today? Are you asking me? Uh, anybody on the panel, you can fight. Oh, I, yeah, I, I feel like, <laughs> okay, so I see, I, so... I kind of, um, I don't know if I reject the respectability politics angle, but I will offer an alternative lens and I will offer uh, the lens of uh, some black uh, pre-colonial history and even uh, some early colonial history uh, before uh, the, the transatlantic slave trade really became entrenched. Um, that there's this tradition of uh, African um, political agents of different levels of class, uh, but especially uh, women, um, uh, being able to uh, manipulate politics from the inside. Um, and and uh, these uh, characters are also uh, supported by different black myths of uh, tricksters and uh, trickster gods, uh, clever gods, gods of wisdom, gods of force, uh, gods of manipulation, gods of dominance. And so I think, um, I think that wisdom gets passed down. So I don't know if it's respectability politics, right? I don't know if she was conceding. Um, Right, because when we look at the FBI, the FBI is interested in her, in my opinion, because of her ability to pull together disjointed movements, disjointed ideas, people that's like, how did she get them to agree? And then you look back and it's like, no one could really figure it out or understand it but Edna. And this is why they're trying to get into her head. Um, so I'm not sure if uh, all of it is respectability politics. I think that's um, a way that she even uh, posited herself that we can deconstruct today because we can understand that she might have even been more clever than that um, than to uh, just be playing respectability because we can see behind closed doors uh, she was very fiery mm -hmm. right um, so she was respectable I maybe in the court right does that mean that she was respectable overall that she was a respectable person uh, or that she really invested in those politics uh, for her survival um, I, I think we should like interrogate that deeper because she was uh, the, the stuff that's highlighted is her, um, you know, calling people's names, calling people scabs, you know, kicking them out of the Communist Party for, for breaking lines and stuff. And um, I think that's a, a different narrative. Yeah, I mean, as the presenter here or as the, the MC here today, I, I, I'm still going to add my own thoughts here. And I'd say there's a difference between uh, respectability politics as uh, an excuse to not do anything and the, and as a you know way of presenting yourself in order to get stuff done. Um, so a lot of times people say, oh well you know we'll put want to put movements down or put uh, you know work down because they don't like how it's presented, but then they use that as an excuse to not do anything. So like you noted, Edna Griffin, you know, she may have in the in public in the court moderated kind of how she appeared in order to win the case, 
but like you said, behind the scenes, she wasn't like not wanting to hurt people's feelings. She was wanting mm-hmm. to and, and, yeah. and I think uh, if I can offer one more thing, uh, uh, just to offer some language um, uh, as an alternative to the uh, respectability politics, I would say uh, we talk about the uh, politics of, subver- of subversion, subversion. Um, and so she was very, so very subversive. And um, I think uh, that's the framework uh, about which I think about um, all of her, unifying all of her movements. Right, right. And, and I would agree with Matei. And, and the thing that's important, and I think Noah can, can bring this up, she won the legal battle, but Katz, after the battle, after the legal battle, still was refusing to serve Black people, people of color. So Edna quickly moved to the boycott, to the protest outside the store. And, and that brought it around eventually to them giving up, Marie's cats gave up. So, so respectability, yes, you know, you use whatever position of power you have, but at the end of the day, you know, as Matei has indicated in, in his leadership uh, in many other young people in the BLM movement is you have to protest. You can win the legal battles to a certain extent. I mean, even in the Iowa Constitution, uh, it, it, the civil rights victory had been won to a certain extent by having it as a right to end desegregate, to end segregation in Iowa. But still, this store and other stores that she had to deal with, and there were others in the 50, 1950s that Edna had to deal with, where she and Stan were turned away. And she was calling for national boycotts of those stores too. So that would be another response, but Noah uh, may also have some information on that too. All right, so first of all, I just wanna say I'm glad that Matei went last because he's clearly far more charismatic than the rest of us. Um, but I, on, the, on this question of respectability politics, um, you know, it's how do you present yourself in, uh, in different situations? And I think one anecdote which is relevant is that I got to interview Phyllis Griffin in doing my research, which is Edna's daughter. Uh, and Phyllis ended up becoming a theater professor. Um, and at the time that I interviewed her, she was at DePaul University. I'm not sure if she's still there. I had the honor of going to a production that she did of an August Wilson play um, in downtown Chicago. Uh, but what she told me was that her mother, Edna, encouraged her to go into acting um, because it's a way to cope when people um, act racist toward you. Um, and I mean, there's the famous poem that I teach my students, we wear the mask um, and how that's a, a burden, but also um, a survival mechanism. Um, and so I think that it, it speaks to um, I, I think the subverse the, the idea that uh, Matei brought up of subversion is is a good one uh, of thinking about what what face do I need to present to the world in this particular context to achieve what I'm hoping to achieve. Awesome, thank you, Noah. Great um, things that everybody. I said. love that. I love that. Um, I would only add that one of the people I learned from was the Reverend Alan Moore, who when he was in Iowa was the urban minister in Fort Dodge. He moved to Milwaukee and was later found murdered inside of his church. Um, Al would talk about being a black man, what we have all shared today. And he would say, the bottom line is, when you are standing on my neck, I will use whatever means necessary to get you off. And whether it's respectability politics, presenting ourselves in certain situations as something that we doesn't capture us all and so on, any tool to fight for justice, I, I think is okay, is justified. And can I add to that? Uh, sure. I think can, uh, that the important part um, is also that um, the politics of subversion, like I think it also uh, includes uh, some sort of uh, deep moral and spiritual foundation because uh, those politics are e- very easy to become confounded, right? You know what I'm saying? Like uh, uh, they become big, easily can become the politics of manipulation, of coercion, 
uh, which is different, right? Those are these these things are uh, slipping into evil or, and destruction and, and counterproductive too. So uh, I imagine she would have had a, a robust like moral and spiritual, uh, uh, you know, study and uh, foundation to 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 uphold and to always guide um, what can get confusing, very confusing. Uh, uh, Travis, there's a question from uh, Pete Myers to, for Mate. Okay. Um, I don't know if Mate can see it, but how can current affinity groups in our community best carry on the legacy of Edna, Edna Griffin? The affinity groups. Yeah, the affinity groups. Um, I think uh, imagination, I think imagination and courage. Um, she was uh, very courageous. Um, and she was uh, also just out in front of a lot of stuff, like a lot of the stuff that she did, like uh, the way that she connected people, the programs that she put on, the ways that she would pressure people was just like audacious. So I, I think um, I think people, you really getting, digging into their imagination and being courageous and being bold. Uh, I think that's really what we need right now. Good deal. Um, we do have some more questions. I'll, I'll ask them. Um, if the virus, this one's from Steve Hudson, if the virus and shutdown wouldn't cause a major change away from capitalism, what more will it take for actual change? What, um, just kind of jumping in here. I mean, we, we are seeing changes that are happening. Uh, clearly, uh, uh, we've seen the uh, voting out of Trump getting rid of hate uh, on a national level. Uh, we have legislation that is being proposed now. The Green New Deal was being proposed last year. Uh, HR1 on voting rights uh, is now put out there. There's also another uh, piece of legislation that's going through Congress right now that has to do with uh, worker rights, labor rights. So we see the different movements that have really been built up over the last uh, several years, especially through the BLM movement, but also we see it through what uh, AOC and the progressives in Congress have been push, putting forth. So we see all these movements, they're happening, legislation is being promoted, uh, Amazon is being organized uh, by a union, and uh, even the new president, Biden, uh, put out a video to promote the right of workers to join unions. So you, you see these movements. And again, with what BLM, with Mate, and other young people and people of color have been pressuring for such a long time, their messages are resonating. It's bringing us to a higher level. So the changes are happening. And as a 64-year-old, I think I might be uh, the oldest one here, although Jerry's right up there with me, we have seen some significant changes over the last several decades. We remember what happened during Reaganomics in the 80s, how everything got slashed on social programs, how the rights of workers were taken away bit by bit, how meatpacking plants were changed from having a good wage in 1978 for, of $18 an hour to now where meatpacking workers are getting paid $16 an hour. So we've seen the stripping away of things, but now due to the movements and many of those again, uh, due to the work of Mate and many young people and people of color and unions and, and other forces uh, coming together in coalition, uh, things are changing, they're reaching critical mass. So uh, I'm hopeful uh, because we've seen the worst Edna clearly experienced some of the worst uh, attacks um, that, uh, that American can, can receive. And uh, so we're around the corner now. We're turning around and things are changing and we need to just continue to build those coalitions. Uh, can I help in and also say, um, one of the things that we think about a lot is uh, how can we get uh, white people to um, redistribute their resources as quickly as possible? You know what I mean? Just like in a, uh, in a communal sense, in an affinity group sense, the institutional sense, on a personal sense. So I think uh, getting together and um, putting your brains together about that too, because I'd be think, sitting around thinking about like all the labor I did and what my bank account looks like. And I'd just be doing the math of America and, and meeting household incomes and all that. And I'd be looking around like just by the math, a lot of y'all's bank accounts got to be looking way better than this. So 
I think that's a big thing. Um, and not just money too, like real resources uh, and think about what resources are and how to redistribute them. Awesome. Anybody else? All right. Uh, Noah, in your classes, what is the ethnicity breakdown at your school? Uh, predominantly white. So I have a unique situation where I'm teaching uh, black history classes and I may have, uh, I've had a few with no black students, uh, sometimes one, two, three, or four. Awesome. All right, there was one more question, but it disappeared. I think maybe somebody's typing out. Yeah, it's, uh, Travis, I wanted to interject the mode. What Mate said was very important. Uh, how do we how do we get the uh, the white community to, to do its part? And that's where we in the party have clearly been asking the right to a job, the right to a living wage, the right to health care for all, the right to education for all. These these are demands that we have we have placed over and over again through the decades. And clearly now uh, legislation is being developed and we need to continue to push for for those rights because that should be the right because we produce the wealth of this country as working people and we deserve to have our fair share. And that, and that to a certain extent was discussed by a certain amount of presidential candidates last year. Yeah. I think, <clears throat> my only thing I'll add is that uh, I think there are other institutions though, right? We should pressure the government, but there are other institutions, there are families. There are neighborhood associations. There are nonprofits. Uh, there are individuals, our institutions in themselves too, as they as they have access to things like bank accounts. And so I think, um, like, if healthcare for all is a demand, yes, demanding that from the government. But in what ways can we redistribute uh, healthcare in the community? You know, we see ourselves coming together and putting together basic basic health supplies. Um, and so I think we have to uh, start being uh, a little bit like like I had just said, like uh, having a little bit more imagination. Um, because while those things are, uh, the, the government is sitting on a lot of stolen resources, uh, so is everyday people. Um, and so like thinking about how to redistribute them for real. I mean, for, for me as, as, you know, a white leftist, um, the reason I'm in, in this struggle is the way I see it. It's when, you know, I go to work, my boss tells me you will do this or you will be laid off. Well, who's the first people that, that, you know, get laid off? Who's the first people to get fired? Who's the people who's really threatening me with, you know, and it tends to be black people who have the lower wages, who get laid off first, who get fired first, who get imprisoned. And, you know, if we allow that on the basis of race, then we're allowing our own uh, lowering of wages, our own lowering of, of living standards, um, just by the simple, you know, being apathetic to somebody's struggles just because they're a different color. So to me, you know, black liberation is my own liberation. It's my own advancement as well, because I can do better if everybody else is doing better too. So, and you know, I, Travis, I would, <laughs> and based on a, on a statement made by a uh, person in the audience, a refocus on mutual aid societies can help with informal redistribution. I agree. And, and we need to be discussing that more. We need to be bringing uh, different groups, building those coalitions as Edna had done before, as members of the party had have done before, and finding ways to do that, to redistribute uh, uh, wealth in the form of mutual aid. I'll add, uh, and you know, people that have uh, that you know have access to various parties and campaigns and such like that. Um, one great example is Indira Shoemaker for uh, Des Moines uh, here in the first ward right here where I'm at right now. Um, one of the things that they're gearing up to do is to do mutual aid programs and do mutual aid research uh, surveys on what services people need as part of the campaign. Right, so we have these campaigns that have large access. To, um, and I know y'all do because I got friends that were political science majors and they got the little intern jobs and they know all the data y'all got. I mean, it's a lot of data and resources and outreach that y'all are capable of doing instead of uh, vexing them 100% uh, towards a capitalist dem democratic system. Um, what portion of those can we put into research and mutual aid? What portion of those can we put uh, campaign resources into direct action? Uh, these are things y'all are allowed to do. These are things I was wondering in 2016, why is the direct Democratic Party itself not performing 
constant direct actions against you know the ice centers why are y'all why why is that um not an investment it's still not an answer that i've heard to, to this day um and so i think that y'all can also look at some of these other tactics and and uh um some of these revolutionary tactics uh or these groundbreaking or controversial tactics or just new um uh ways of uh, political organization and saying how can we bring them uh uh you know how can we bring them more and more uh you know capital <laughs> Awesome. Um, I think that's, oh, here we go. Um, from Barbara Finney, uh, I heard the term Red New Deal used and it's new to me. Could someone explain that, that more, please? Thank you. you, you had mentioned that, Matei. I was just echoing that in solidarity. Um, so uh, I don't know much about this, just conversations that I've had uh, with fellow indigenous organizers. Um, but the idea again that, um, that the Green New Deal, uh, we have to think about, I'll say it in this way, because um, I know more so uh, from Huey P. Newton's perspective, uh, which is that sometimes um, that in our efforts to make demands that improve people's lives, uh, we concede capitalist language, right? So if the Green New Deal is focused on creating jobs, we have to understand that jobs are a, a unit of capitalism. Um, so, you know, what does it look like to break down that language and to get to languages that redistribute resources to people that have had them stolen, not necessarily build more resources, resources for is what is already a white patriarchal capitalist society. And so I would, I would ask, because uh, the Green New Deal also does not have really substantial substantive policies. So the question of what it will be uh, is, is in the air. And I think we could look to the green, Red New Deal to influence it or to vex it or to transfer it into the Red New Deal. I think uh, it's a very flexible situation as well. Thank you, Matei. Um, for Jerry, would you say there is anything representing the term liberation theology over, over here in Iowa today? Um, that's hard for me to say. I'm a little bit out of touch with what's going on in the church in Iowa and Ashley since I've been retired. However, I think that um, the work that we do with progressive groups, uh, working with churches and churches working with progressive groups is a part of that. Um, there are folks I know who try to carry on the work and consider themselves liberation theologists uh, within my own denomination. Um, and as I felt when I was active, um, we get ignored, <laughs> I think. Um, I, I would point to, for example, St. Mark's United Methodist Church in Iowa City, um, Trinity Las Americas in Des Moines, um, are two examples that come readily to mind at this point. And um, I've drawn a blank on any others at this point. That, that um, the Religion Commission of the party and, and the work that we're trying to do along with you and Joe and, and other comrades here in Iowa and Nebraska is, is a part of that too, I think. Yeah, I, I was going to bring up Trinity Las America specifically because I know uh, when I was with BSA, um, they helped us host some of our working groups and they had, um, they gave away a lot of food there and, and uh, I know like Alejandro there uh, led protests against ICE uh, a couple of years ago. So uh, yeah, definitely. I, I don't know if there's a, a an organized liberation theology movement, but definitely there's a, a big progressive um, strain that's very active in the community, especially out of the Methodist church, especially out of Tr Trinity Methodist here in Iowa. So. Right. And one of the things that, that is happening that, um, Gil Dawes, who now lives in Indianola and is a member of our club, is still leading a base community Bible study on Zoom Wednesdays at 1130. And um, that has anywhere from 15 to 20 participants um, that is a part of that. And those type of Bible studies where we look at the political situation, and again, everybody expresses their own thoughts and feelings is a part of that work also. I'm currently not leading one, 
being new to where I live now, I'm trying to develop those contacts and thinking it's about time to start asking folks if they want to be involved in that. Okay. Okay. Um, looks like, uh, okay, Lowell has an observation, but not a question, but I, I can, I'll read it anyway. Um, this one's from Lowell Denny. Uh, the best, and he says, the best and perhaps the only place to build these coalitions are public sector workers. Uh, with factories gone, public sector workers, healthcare workers, and, and lastly, public education are sites of black, white, and Latin, and other workers of color are centers, are centered. Uh, the private sector has successfully removed most people of color. Um, do y'all have any thoughts about that observation? Joe or, or Matei or, or Jerry or anybody? Uh, Travis, go ahead and re repeat that again. Okay. Um, Lowell says uh, the best and perhaps only place to build these coalitions are public sector workers. Uh, with factories gone, public sector workers, healthcare workers, and lastly, public education are sites of uh, black, white, Latin, and other workers of color are centered. Uh, the private sector has successfully removed most people of color. Um, do you have any thoughts about that? Any agree, disagree? Well, it, well, you, we we have to build we have to build movements in whatever form, wherever they are. Public sector clearly plays plays a big role. Uh, but we still do have manufacturing. We, we are still doing a lot of different things. Uh, meat packing uh, composes 500,000 workers. When we look at agricultural workers, that's 22 million uh, people who work in agriculture. So when we look at the public sector, yes, it's a key element, but many different elements. When it comes to people of color, we compose most of the 22 million people from, uh, from working in the fields to processing uh, the, uh, the livestock uh, to serving it. So there's a lot of different ways of doing it, but clearly building coalitions, working in different, different sectors, realizing again, when it comes to people of color, we're in many different uh, uh, sectors of the economy and uh, construction is another one too. So uh, there's a lot there. And so we have to cover all those bases. It's very important. Yeah, I, I driving around Iowa, it's almost like, um, you know, the state of Iowa is almost like its own big giant factory because you have fields everywhere, but those fields aren't being, you know, they, the food goes somewhere and you have giant machines that have to be serviced and built and you have um, big factories, really factories to process meat and process uh, livestock into meat that we eat. You have uh, refineries to produce, um, you know, all the fertilizer and everything else. So there, there are, in Iowa, most of your workers are, in fact, private sector workers. And, and farming is not just, you know, a, a farmer and his land. It's, it really is a, a factory operation. Um, yeah. A lot of it more and more moving to that. Right. And then there are some questions that were brought up. Travis, to uh, Melissa Ford had brought up some questions uh, that we were answering online, but maybe the, maybe the rest of the group here wants to hear it. Uh, question was, Edna Griffin seemed to have moved many groups from Democrats to unions to communists to progressives. Do you have a sense of how Ms. Griffin negotiated the tension between radical groups and mainstream organizations? Clearly what Edna was doing, and, and she, ex she explained it to me, and of course, Phyllis had stated it to Noah, you know, uh, Edna was traveling around the state and also in the Midwest to meet with union leaders, workers, meatpacking workers, farmers uh, through various organizations, uh, providing a message, support, solidarity. Uh, again, her work with Henry A. Wallace in the Progressive Party when Henry A. Wallace was running for president uh, with Mr. Wallace uh, even going to her house to discuss uh, issues of important. We have a progressive history here in Iowa, but it has not been told uh, until recently as with what Noah has indicated. So that is how that was done. Now, Noah had, had a response too. Noah, do you want to answer that? Uh, well, just that, um, you know, there were, there were turf wars and tensions between, for example, the NAACP and the Progressive Party of Iowa, uh, and both of them um, 
were integral to the victory over cats. Uh, and in fact, Edna Griffin's lawyer was a, a guy named Charles P. Howard, who'd be another figure that would be worthy of uh, more exploration. He seems like a very colorful fellow. Um, and, uh, you know, he um, basically said, look, I'm a member of both the NAACP and the Progressive Party. And it's, it's not true that the NAACP didn't do enough. We, we voted $200 out of our treasury for this fight. Um, and the black newspaper at the time, the Iowa bystander, um, basically, uh, had an editorial where it said that, you know, this was an example of different organizations working together for the betterment of Iowa. And we need more of this and less, less quibbling over who gets the credit and more, um, having, having organizations that may not have the exact same mission working together, because that's how you get things done. Uh, there was I guess it was another question about uh, how to build even more support coalitions of labor, doing more to support demands, liberation movement, so forth and so on. Uh, should we answer that one? Uh, yeah, you can go ahead. You want to read it again for me? Yeah, uh, this one uh, it said for Joe, I'm wondering how we can build an even more support for the incredible coalition of labor and doing more support more to support the demands of other liberation movements. It seems that we are reaching a new level of being put to put together a way for all the working class to move forward. Racism chained us all, including white workers. My response to that and, and the response from those of us who are comrades is that as progressives, as you know, Democrats, socialists, communists, so forth. We have to be switchboard operators. We have to connect the different groups with each other. For many, many years, uh, groups have operated in silos, no pun intended coming from Iowa, but groups have kept to themselves. They have not shared their information. They have tried to take on their, these battles by themselves for a better, uh, better world or a better America, uh, better for workers, better for people of color. But none of that can be achieved unless we build coalitions. And we have to have people who work between groups, in groups, build bridges, communicate things. It's not that hard to do, but there is a tendency for people to kind of be like rubber bands. They only stretch so far and then they go back to their original form. For those of us who are progressives, who are comrades, we must help them connect with each other. We must urge, put pressure on labor, organize labor to connect with people of color. We must identify progressives like Mate and many young people and people of color who are in leadership positions who want to get active, connect them with labor, connect them with religious groups, connect them with different political parties, with leaders within government entities. And we must communicate messages of support, of economic interest, all of those things are very important. And, and only, it, sometimes it takes a small group, Edna proved that, but it's not difficult to do. Again, Edna showed how it was done. And, and clearly that's always been our history. It always starts with a small group and you have to connect people and groups to each other, find common interest. That's our responsibility. So it looks like Travis, uh, his phone died. So uh, Joe, I don't know if you want to take over the emceeing for the rest of the program. All right, you're muted. Okay, sure. Yep, I'm back here. So we have some other responses here. Um, Gus Griffin. He stated, wouldn't the likes of Ned Turner and John Brown be viewed under the umbrella of liberation theology? And if so, shouldn't we be more flexible about citing where and when it began, just as we should about the origin of the civil rights movement? Is that a Jerry question? I, I think it is, and I responded um, typing, but it went out privately. Absolutely, and I appreciate that correction there. Um, as Edna and so many others before predated what we normally recognize as the civil rights movement, Nat Turner, John Brown, and so many others. 
uh, use their faith beliefs to motivate what they did and the rebellions that they led and, and tried to do. So yes, before the formal naming of liberation theology, they definitely would be a part of that, yes. Thank you for that comment, Gus. Okay, another question. Uh, ah, this is very interesting. Uh, there are all males on this very interesting panel, but who are some of the females involved in this effort in Iowa and elsewhere that you can acknowledge today? We have a lot of comrades and, and uh, female activists out there, but I'm going to hand this off to Matai, Matei, because he's going to be able to uh, name a lot of young people like Indira, Indira. Indira, oh, Indira's a big one. Indira Shoemaker's a big one. Um, what up? Okay, I have my friend here. Oh, sorry. Oh, well, my friend next to me, Olivia Samples, who's organizing the Black Kin, Net Kin Network, and they've really been my source of uh, information on the uh, Black maternal health uh, and the Black maternal health crisis in uh, Iowa. And then we have uh, all the BLM organizers, too. Uh, Jaleesa Johnson, uh, head of the culture department, Linda Brown, uh, who I think I mentioned earlier, um, Kiara Banks, um, Yena um, Balancani, uh, who? Chelsea. I mean, yeah, Chelsea. The, the Chelsea Chisholm Vargas, who ran uh, um, for city council, um, who's, you know, a um, big reproductive rights uh, health uh, advocate. And then, um, I don't know. Uh, also, I look back to um, Evelyn K. Davis um, and Joanne, uh, Joanne Cheetah, also in Des Moines, have like very uh, foundational legacies that um, I find myself materially benefiting from. Uh, so, you know, those are some, some people, yeah. You got it, you got it. So yes, so what we see is uh, many young people, men and women, a lot of women uh, running for political positions in Daira, uh, Shoemaker running for city council here, Ward 1, Chelsea Chisholm who ran uh, in Ward 4 in Des Moines, Latina. Um, and then Veronica Guerrera, Marlu Abarca, many, many uh, others. Uh, and it was unfortunate that we couldn't get them on the panel today. Uh, yeah, Joe, if I may, um, I responded also to Rita's question. And my sense is, given what you just shared and Mate shared, that within the party itself, within the end of Griffin Club, we need to do better. We, we need to um, recruit and, and bring into leadership some women, some more people of color and, and folks that represent there. There you go. I think for too long, we've all been operating in silos, not building those coalitions. Uh, clearly, <clears throat> we, and, we and the party and in other groups realize the importance of connecting with each other uh, it, it's so important. And again, with the BLM movement uh, that really uh, hit, did a significant, important job last year of demanding justice, uh, that has uh, really uh, changed things significantly for the various movements and really helped uh, change the way the elect election turned out. So, so building those bridges, those connections, it, it's changed uh, some of the things that we've done before and uh, we're gonna move forward, but we need to do it together. Uh, another one. Okay, we're getting uh, some nice responses here. Recommending a book, there's some books. Uh, recommendation, a book by Kenga Yamada Taylor, How to Get Free, Black Feminism, The Kamahi River Collective. There's a book on how to be an anti-fascist, how to be an anti-racist. Uh, hey, Joe, uh, I was curious if you wanted to show your slides. Uh, since yeah. We're up soon. yeah, go ahead. Please, please show those. So we'll show you some, uh, some slides, photos of Edna from the past. And a number of these photos came from 
from Noah. So Noah uh, had these photos that he collected for his research, Cat's Drug Store downtown, uh, which was renamed the uh, Griffin Building. Uh, but uh, Noah, correct me if I'm wrong, was that about 10 years ago? Um, yeah, I know in 1998, in the 50th anniversary, there was that's when the plaque was uh, was put there. I'm not sure when the building was renamed. Okay. Yeah. What was interesting when uh, they celebrated uh, Edna Griffin and her uh, success on winning that battle in 1948, uh, still at that point, they didn't know the complete history. And thanks to Noah's work which has really enlightened all of us and provided a pathway. Uh, we now have this additional information that we will continue to promote. So what's the next slide? Yeah, now this was the important part. And you know, we, you know, the, uh, the general community always talks about how Edna won the court battle. But here we see Edna here, she's uh, second from the, uh, the left on my side or second from the right on your side. Uh, even though they won the legal battle, they still were losing until they had the boycott. They had to do the boycott to put pressure, to really shut down cats, to make them realize that enough is enough. So that's what that is about. This other one, uh, Edna uh, Griffin was a supporter of, of Miss Chisholm, Shirley Chisholm, when she ran for president. Uh, that was a very important uh, uh, campaign during that time. We also see Louise Noun, who's next to Edna in this photo. Louise Noun was a progressive here in Iowa who uh, was one of the founders of the ACLU and, the, uh, and a number of uh, women's groups here in Iowa. Edna and Louise became close friends. Um, and that was again on how she built bridges. Uh, next slide. Uh, here, the, the picture of Edna in her military form. I, I had the privilege of getting uh, that photo, several photos of, of Edna in those uh, when we uh, did a fundraiser for Edna and the People's World. So uh, we got two of these photos from Edna. Uh, we gave one to the uh, Black History Museum here in Des Moines, and then the other one is hanging in my office. This other picture of Edna uh, was when I knew Edna in, in the 1980s. And, uh, and she, she just, again, a very amazing person. Next slide. This was a fundraiser that we again did for the people's world. So here we have Edna, Evelyn Davis, Mary Campos, and Stan Griffin. And then me uh, behind them all. Uh, and this was done uh, uh, again to raise money for the paper for the people's world. Uh, it was called the People's Daily World at the time, a progressive newspaper uh, that the party has supported. Uh, so yes, that was an amazing time. Next photo, do we have another one? Okay, I think that's it. But again, the work that Enna did was, it, it changed me, it changed many other people. Noah uh, had also uh, gathered information uh, during his interview with Phyllis uh, Griffin of, of when, uh, when Edna passed away um, at her funeral service, there were a number of young people who went who, who thanked the family for Edna's leadership, her guidance, her mentoring. Edna would welcome everybody into her home uh, uh, when, they, when they lived over on 44th Street. Uh, always, again, welcomed every, everyone. Paul Robeson spent time at her house again, Henry A. Wallace, uh, many social justice labor leaders, uh, farm labor leaders, many others. Education was key. She had thing that she would always say to her, to Phyllis, her children was never stop learning, keep on studying, keep on fighting for the right thing. And, um, and that was remembered. And she was also a teacher at a certain point in her life. Uh, at Tech High School in Des Moines. So knowledge is important, showing compassion, showing leadership, building bridges. Joe, can I just say, I would, I would highly recommend for anybody that's interested to check out the Iowa Women's Archive at the University of Iowa. They have uh, digitized 
digitized archive, uh, completely free. You can just go to the internet and type in Iowa Women's Archive and then type in Edna Griffin and all the primary source resources are there. Um, and it's a great resource, not just for her, but for many, many women in, in Iowa and the United States. That is important, Noah. Thank you so much. And thank you for doing the research. It was your research when you were a student at the University of Iowa, getting your master's degree to, to sit down with Phyllis to gather this information, to gather all the FOIA information. I've gotten to know Edna even more thanks to your work. And, and we cannot forget all the things that Edna did. And Noah, you play a part in this and we really appreciate it. Jerry, thank you very much uh, for all the work that you've done over the decades uh, on the religious front. Matai, thank you. Thank you for, for fighting the fight. You, you've done what others have only talked about. You, you have taken on this struggle. You're truly a leader, many, many young people. We have learned from you. We really appreciate everything that you have done and we will look to you uh, for your leadership from here on out and we'll help you build whatever bridges need to be built to fight for social justice, to fight to end racism, for equality, mutual aid, all those things. Dante, thank you. Thank you for, for all the work on putting on this event. We really appreciate it. Travis, you're sitting in the room now with me right now. Thank you for moderating this. Thank you all. Thank you for the people who've come in to listen to this event. It's being recorded. So I know it's going to be played over and over again. So thank you all, friends, fellow travelers, progressives, working people. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for the program. And I uh, did want to announce quickly that uh, Melissa Ford, Dr. Melissa Ford, who's on the call asking questions, uh, we, as in the Claudia Jones School, will be hosting her uh, doing another program on Black uh, radical women in the Midwest um, on March 24th, which is a Wednesday evening, I believe, um, towards the end of the month. Um, check that out. There's a live stream link on our YouTube channel uh, where you will also be able to find this uh, recording. So uh, thank you, everyone. Um, Mate, I don't know if you have any last words that you want to say to folks since your video is on. Oh, no. uh, no, I'll say uh, shout out to my team. Uh, shout out to um, all the BLM organizers. You know, we're really a collective. So um, shout out to them. I, without them, I wouldn't be here. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. And uh, have a great rest of your evening and uh, see you all soon again.